first off, it seemed to have crashed. Is that a particular problem on your end? Well, it just crashed. I did just get the latest location for Mary Lee. What's happening is um, it's just thrilling how much activity we're getting on the tracker and the actual increase in traffic. Is, is that just today? the uh, tracker to track, to crash. Is that just from today? It's just started to happen in the last couple of days. I mean, it, what, it's just thrilling for me. I never expected so many people to be following the sharks up and down the east coast of the United States, and we're starting to get news stories in every town as Mary Lee moves up and down the southeast, and all that awareness has driven a lot of traffic to the actual shark tracker, and we're actually suffering a little bit with that increased volume and traffic, and it's crashing the shark tracker. So we're constantly now trying to improve its capacity so that all the people who want to learn and watch can. Okay, yeah, I thought it was funny when we saw that it had crashed because my uh, boss, he posted it on Facebook and has gotten a ton of shares. So we've been, we're blaming it on him right now. Yeah, I mean, you're going up the definitely the right train of thought. If you see and look and you Google white sharks in the southeast, you'll see a string of articles that have occurred over the last several days, and that's really spiked the traffic, which is the whole vision behind the tracker for me. I mean, it's just thrilled. I wanted to give the information to everybody so that school kids in their science classes could watch the sharks alongside the PhDs and the public. Whoever wanted to learn about white sharks could learn at the same time as a PhD, so I just created the tracker. And I'm like, free for everybody. I want everybody to watch, to be interested, to be aware, to learn about sharks and their plight and shark finning and how it must be stopped because sharks are the great balance keepers of the ocean, and we need to help people understand that. So I just decided one day I'm going to build a tracker and give it to everybody real time. And now to, to see communities embracing it and school systems embracing it and having problems with traffic and the site crashing is, is just really thrilling for me. Hey, listen, I completely agree. It is it's fascinating around here. We have our bosses just sitting there watching your tracker, and once it went down, we're like, no, what are we going to do now? So. Yeah. Yeah it's, yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, this is for the first time in history we're solving a 400-million-year-old secret. Where do the Atlantic white sharks move to and from? Where and when are they breeding and feeding and giving birth? And that's just essential information we have to learn so that we can protect their future and manage them correctly. But then to have this public tool to share with everyone so they can see this puzzle solved for the first time, it, it's, it's, just, it's just great. I mean, we... For people who are like, should we be scared? There's a there's a 16 and a half foot white shark, four and a half miles off Myrtle Beach. You know, the answer is no. She's always been there. It's just now, for the first time in history, we know she's there, and that is just kind of a fantastic thing for everybody to share at the same moment. Yeah, I think that's what I've kind of come across today because everybody's like, oh, my gosh, there's a huge shark off there. But, I, you know, just like what you said, we've not known it. But now we're able to know that because you guys are tagging them. So I guess uh, just from the research that you've done so far on these sharks, would you say that it is common off a of South Carolina coastline for a great white 16-foot shark to be out there? Well, nobody knows that um, for sure. But what is certain is Mary Lee is there. And Mary Lee probably represents how other white sharks are moving as well. But the thing is, they've always been there. They're an important part of the system. Nothing should change in people's relationship with the water or use of the water. We just know she's there now for the first time. So we need to get more data, and we need to get more sharks tagged so we can see other sharks utilizing the area and then start to understand why are they there, what are they doing there, make sure we create an effective system to ensure they have a future there, and then we'll get more and more detailed answers to a lot of the questions people have as we continue to track her and get more sharks tagged. And, um, and we'll get a better understanding of how much the southeast and Myrtle Beach and South Carolina, Georgia, and northern Florida are a part of the white sharks' lives. So it, there's so many questions, and people oftentimes ask me when we tag sharks, where are they going to go? And the answer is nobody knows. It's just to bring the spirit of exploration and pioneering research right into the households of families across the country, tracking these sharks with modern technology real time. It can make everyone an explorer, everyone a pioneer. Everyone is learning at the same time. And to kind of get that enthusiasm going and get ocean on the brain 
uh, is what we're trying to do so people want to look after its future. And uh, and that's what's going on with the tracker. Yeah, I get, so you're saying a lot of the questions that haven't been answered yet. So if I were to ask you, like, where do sharks typically, you know, end up, or do they like cold water or warm water, like, would you be able to answer that in a, any particular way? Well, we can definitely tell you what sort of water temperatures white sharks like, you know, whether it's warm or cold water. They prefer a little cooler water. They're not a tropical shark like a tiger shark. Um, and that fits in with your water temperatures off South Carolina, so nothing shocking there. What we need to figure out is exactly where and when are they breeding, exactly when and where are they giving birth, and what are they doing in these migratory areas in between. And what we're seeing identified right now is an area that a mature female white shark likes to utilize, that kind of southeast area there. Now we've got to figure out, well, why? Is she there because there's a big food source there? Is she there because there's other mature white sharks and she has an opportunity to mate? Is she there because she's pregnant and she's preparing to give birth and it's an excellent nursery area? Those are the kind of questions that are going to reveal themselves as we track her longer. The mature female great white shark has a two-year annual migration from its mating site. So it will arrive at a mating site, breed, and then it departs. It goes and it feeds for 18 months because that's the gestation period of a white shark. And that 18 months later, it leads you to the holy grail of white shark science, which are these nurseries, because that's where the white shark is most vulnerable and where we need to protect them because they're small. So as, as time goes by and we continue to track Amy and we get a full two-year migratory loop from her, we'll then be able to try to identify where and when did the breeding occur, where and when did the birthing occur, and we'll have more and more answers as to how, how and why she used the southeast. It's just a little bit early, and we need to get a few more sharks tagged. Okay, so I, I guess uh, another thing that's come up on Facebook, a few questions that people have been asking us and we have no idea, but um, where there's one great white shark, is there, I mean, I know they tend to travel alone. I mean, is that true, or, or should we expect to, you know, should there be – you know, you'd think there'd be more out there than just Mary Lee right now. I would think that there's more out there than Mary Lee right now. What we have when we've looked at the Guadalupe white shark, for instance, is large numbers of them gather at the breeding site, and that's where you have them all gathering at one place like Guadalupe Island. Um, and we don't know where that breeding aggregation in the Atlantic is. Could it be Cape Cod? Could it be the southeast? I don't know. That will unfold as we track her for a longer period of time. Um, and if it is a breeding site or a birthing site, you would see larger um, numbers of animals in those areas. Then also, though, in between the times they're at those areas, they migrate and they travel and they eat. And that's when they spread out and they're not so together in numbers. So if this is just an area that she's migrating through and feeding, there might not be a big number of sharks in the area. So still, we just need a little bit more time to get a handle on that. And, you know, who knows, we might need to get the ship down there and explore that region of the Atlantic Ocean and try to get a handle on if there are more white sharks there, let's get there, let's tag them, and let's follow them back to where they came from. Did they all come from the Med? Did they, I mean, did they all come from Cape Cod? Or could some of them have come from the Mediterranean or Africa or South America? Nobody knows. It could be a place where white sharks gather to feed because there's a lot of food there. If that were the case, perhaps it's an Atlantic event and sharks come from all over. Maybe it's nothing. She's just swimming through on her way to go to a mating site or a breeding area. Lots of questions. A little time, we'll have the answers. Okay, that, that sounds great. Um, I guess a little bit about the whole tagging process, because to me, and I know I don't know a whole lot about them, but they seem a little scary to me, and you guys are just picking them out of the ocean and tagging them. Tell me a little bit about that process. Well, the really groundbreaking thing that's allowing this information to even be available is the fact that for the first time in history, we've pioneered a safe method for capturing these ocean giants and letting them go alive. And in the process, we give the leading scientists in the world 15 minutes of access to use the latest technology and have the latest experiments to advance our understanding of the white shark. So. Because we can catch them and give these guys access, these leading thought makers like Dr. Greg Skomel, who's leading up the project with Mary Lee, he's able to put a spot tag on her fin, which means every time she comes up finning, 
it beams our location into a lab, and that's what shows up on the real-time shark tracker, and that's what's allowing everyone to track the shark. At the same time, though, for the first time in history, he's getting blood samples to understand the shark's hormones, to see if she could potentially be ripe for breeding in that area where we sampled her. So we get some reproductive uh, type of information on her. We also did some stress physiology research. How did the tagging process impact the shark? Was it hard on the shark or pretty easy on the shark? We're finding it takes them about 30 minutes to recover, which means it's not, they are under some stress, but it's not any sort of significant stress to their health and their future. So we got all sorts of things. We're getting bacteria off their teeth and gums, developed the first shark bite antibiotic because most people lose limbs or die of secondary infection because there's so much bacteria in the mouth of the sharks. Well, now for the first time, we're sourcing that live bacteria, culturing it, and allowing people to develop antibiotics for it. So there's a lot going on. The primary responsibility for me always is to ensure the safety of the people and then the safety of the shark. You know, and I'm proud of our record. We've been the only people who've accomplished this in history. It's exploding the body of knowledge forward, which is allowing us for the first time in history to manage these great predators correctly. And um, in the past, in order to do this type of research, they used to have to catch the sharks, kill them, and cut them open and learn. And now we've developed a great method where we can capture and release them and have a super high success rate. Okay, that sounds great. I, I guess just a couple more questions here. Um, first, uh, I know she's 16 feet you know, 3,500 pounds, is that considered among the great whites a big one or a smaller one or medium size? Like, what would you say she is on that level? Oh, Mary Lee is a very big, mature female great white shark. She's 16 and a half feet long, weighs uh, almost two tons, 3,500 pounds, and she is considered a full grown, mature female great white shark, and the females are much bigger than the males. Now, that's not to say she won't continue to get bigger. She will, because sharks do get bigger. But she is big, and she is mature, and she is not considered a small fish. She is considered a very big white shark. Okay. Um, I'm about, I'll, I'll let you go here in just a minute. But since your website is down, we just want to know that last ping from Mary Lee, are you guys able to see if that was still um, the one off uh, four miles off of Polly's Island at 9.51 this morning? I just did check with the people who are managing the shark tracker, and they did say that um, Mary Lee, it's named after my mom, um, is four and a half miles in front of Myrtle Beach right now. Um, do you know where um, Magnolia Beach is north of Midway Inlet? Magnolia Beach. Um, I'm not sure, but I can, yeah, I'll look it up. Here, is that close to Myrtle Beach? Do you know how to convert to Greenwich Mean Time to East Coast Time? I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, so that's going to be seven, two. That's going to be uh, fourteen oh four. That's going to be two oh four. Yes, two oh right? four. Yeah. So at two oh four, she was off Magnolia Beach. At two oh four p.m., she was just less than one mile off Magnolia Beach, north of Midway Inlet. Than one mile. Wow. Midway Inlet. It's called. I, I'm just looking on this kind of. Do you need me to give you more generic terms? I mean, I zoomed in on this kind of, it was so tight to the beach, this just generic map online, and it had, it just said Magnolia Beach. No, I can look that up. Um, That's fine. That'll be fine. Um, so I, I t when I talked to Chris Berger earlier, he said he was going to send me MOV files from you guys tagging the sharks. Is that still possible? Sure. Sure, of course. Okay, just yeah. Call them in and handle your business with them. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's that's everything I need from you, Mr. Fisher. I appreciate it. This was fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So she's a mile off the beach at 2:04 this afternoon. Oh my goodness. Off okay. Magnolia Bay, Magnolia Beach, north of Midway Inlet. Okay. Oh, if you have a problem with finding that, call me back. Okay, I will. Is there a and particular? And the tracker, we don't know why the tracker is down. I'm pretty sure it's just crashing because of the activity. Okay. Yeah, we'll keep looking uh, at and that. And so we're obviously, I got people working on getting it back up right now. But again, people just need to do what they always do. This shark has been swimming a mile off these beaches for the last 30 years. It's just for the first time in history, we know it. Yeah. Okay. There's no, it's a great story. It's a great thing. It's, it's uh, you know, it's a sign of a healthy ocean.